Walking is a man's best medicine, and a woman's best medicine too, I might add. So uh, this is sort of one of those other landmark ones that was done by Erickson. He's from the States, and it's some, he, he and his colleagues were some of the first ones to prove that walking changes our brain structure. So the MRI scans, they took people who were not very fit or active, and they were older, and they did stretching. Stretching's better than nothing, but it wasn't so helpful. Actually, moving your body and walking is better. Walkers, not stretchers. Their memory centers, those hippocampi, improved. And what walking does is it creates, it's like a, taking a pill that affects our brain chemistry. This natural hormone that allows our neurons and brain cells to connect better with each other and to grow new connections called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, neurotrophic from Latin or Greek or whatever it is, neurotrophic means to grow. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is enhanced by movement. So you don't need to take a pill. Physical activity provides per transient, meaning in the, in the immediate future, and permanent changes in our brain. It improves our blood flow to the brain, right? We need blood flow because it carries oxygen to the brain. Angiogenesis, there's new blood vessels that are formed. Brain growth, so the synapses are enhanced. That's the connection where the brains communicate. And it changes our neurotransmitters. Very powerful stuff. I wish I could put exercise in a pill. I would be rich. So Dr. Mike Evans is a U of T family medicine doctor who prescribes exercise. And if you want to Google his name and just put in 23 and a half hours, it's about an eight and a half minute YouTube video. It's well worth it to, to hear what he has to say about this prescription of walking half an hour, five days per week. And so he basically puts forth the argument is that you prioritize the time you sit on the sofa watching television. You could be sitting on the sofa, what I do to get my steps in, if I don't have them in by the end of the day, if I have to watch the new moves, I'm just doing this, drives my husband batty. <laughs> I say, do you want me to be in a wheelchair, honey? <laughs> no, okay then, shut up. <laughs> All right, so now we know that walking all by itself really is healthy to do, but can we combine it with other interventions? Like so, in this Learning the Ropes program, we had it by a different name, and it was run by Dr. Fogarty out of Parkwood, and we did a randomized control trial where people would get their cognitive training and Tai Chi, combine it with a little bit of exercise. Because in theory, Tai Chi is already a mixed, very potent treatment. Tai Chi is a type of physical meditation. It's a physical exercise also. And there's other benefits in terms of the, if you do Tai Chi in a group, there's a sense of wellness and connectedness you have with the teacher and with your other participants, even though you're not saying anything. You have a sense of belonging and it reduces anxiety. There's lots of benefits from Tai Chi. So that trial, as I'll mention in another slide, it actually was sort of neutral, but it was not enough people in that trial. Every, everybody improved. So if you took this learning the ropes program, you improved, and if you took learning the ropes with Tai Chi, you still improved, but there was not a lot of difference between the two groups. But in these trials, um, the bottom line, these were, this was another one of these, analyze the whole group of articles that are of similar. So if you combine um, people, this was studies done with people with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease or healthy subjects, if you give them exercise and cognitive exercise, brain exercise, the bottom line is they're all beneficial. So that's the summary. Not going into the details of the nitty gritty of each individual article. Um, and this is a similar, a systematic review. There were six trials that met the quality assurance analysis that this author did. And that's a big effect size. So with, when people have Alzheimer's disease, if they exercise, they're more likely, activities of daily living, 
is what ADL stand for, they're more likely to remain independent in their basic self-care functions of remembering how to shave and wash and dress. And the other thing we know about exercise is that aerobic exercise like walking is good and that what we call resistance training. So there's therabands and I have to be very careful in prescribing resistance training so I don't want you to go to the world gym or gold's gym or whatever gym, good life, and start power lifting weights and rip your rotator cuff to pieces. <laughs> But gentle exercise with light weights or these TheraBand elastics is, helps the body chemistry and brain chemistry in a different way than walking does, and they're complementary. So executive function is not memory, per se, remembering a shopping list. It's reasoning, planning, sequencing. Those are all good brain function. And the aerobic is a little more specific to memory as well as reaction time. So these trials basically said that aerobic as well as strengthening exercise improves independence and physical performance for people already with dementia. And I believe, yes, these were studies done with people who have mild cognitive impairment. And uh, there's a series of publications because as a professor at a university, the more publications you get, the more likely you're going to get promoted. So if you do one study, you better get about four or five, six articles all from the one study. So, so you chop it into bits and get, get publications out. So basically, resistance training once or twice a week resulted in, one, muscle is stronger. That makes really intuitive sense, right? And ba just balance training, they had a loss of muscle strength in, in this study of 16%. They, the people who exercised had a little bit of musculoskeletal pain for the first month. That all went away, and after four weeks, nobody complained of any pain. So resistance training is more efficacious than balance and toning with improving attention, paying attention to things. And that's important if you're a driver in particular and executive functions, sequencing, planning, reasoning, judgment. And actually the dose, we're still working on the dose. In this study, once a week was enough to get a result, and so was the twice a week group. So you can see that they improved, but the ba balance and toning, their, their cognitive performance was worse. And then part of this other study was another publication where they took some of these women in Vancouver and did MRI tests on them. And their brain, their, their brain health in terms of little, I call them ditzels, <laughs> little white matter lesions that occur in the MRI that can be associated with microvascular disease, there was a lot less. So the resistance training compared with the balance and toning group had healthier brains on the MRI imaging. And what they call reduced the white matter hyperintensities, the healthier brains were associated with maintenance of their gait speed. So how fast we walk is important. It's related, you know, that you've heard probably on CBC radio that hand grip is associated with vitality. So is gait speed. <laughs> and the Stroop test is a test of attention and executive function. So they are nearly better on that. Um, that doesn't say anything except complicate what I already told you. Um, this was an, another study, same authors. Uh, aerobic training improves the size of the hippocampus, another author who shows to do that. And um, I don't remember the details of the Davis study, but I think we should write to the Ministry of Health Right? So the, our government is cutting back on our hospital care. We have lots of burdens worrying about how to pay for all the baby boomers' health. If they p invested in exercise programs, they're going to overall save our health care system a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that's another really important Canadian trial about exercise. 
All right, so this was this JAMA, that's the Journal of the American Medical Association. So high level journal, nothing bad, I don't think, gets through their <laughs> scrutiny. And uh, this trial was again stretching the brain exercise combined with physical exercise. And what was interesting about this is that, so you would ex expect from the, uh, some of the other trials I told you about, that stretching and toning, probably not as good as an hour of walking or Roomba Zumba, whatever they call it. Um, and maybe that certain types of mental activity might be better than passive watching it educational DVD. That's in theory. This trial, again, relatively small numbers, all of them improved. So my basic message is, do something. <laughs> do something, not nothing. So if you're just doing yoga and stretching and toning, that's better than sitting on the couch watching television. We have theory to support what I said before. But again, I don't want the confirmation bias, so I had to put this one in. It's still positive for exercise. All right, I put this one in because this was another cost-cutting, um, important study. This was in, uh, I think, Finland. The final X stands for Finland. I know it was in Scandinavia somewhere. And they had people with uh, a caregiver who had, they had Alzheimer's disease and a caregiver at home. And they randomized the groups into three people. One was usual care, called the control group. They had another group who had a home-based exercise program that was led by their caregiver. Then they had another one that was a group exercise program, and they had twice a week. So the caregiver, and they had journals to write down, and the caregiver had to, come on, get up off the couch, come on, we're doing this now. Whereas, okay, Connie, get in the car, and they brought him to maybe a center like this or the McCormick home or someplace, and they had professionals lead the group exercises. Mm -hmm. And the, the people with Alzheimer's disease who were in the control group deteriorated the fastest. In the, all, both exercise group, they had fewer falls. So to, for me, as a geriatrician, I want to reduce falls in all of my patients. What happens to people who fall? Well, if they break their hip over the age of 80, 25% are dead in less than a year after their hip fracture. Not to mention, if they survive, they're more likely to live in a nursing home. Right, so I want to prevent falls. And all of that falling is associated with health care costs. Right? Um, so the costs were lower in uh, both groups. Well, the, they trended less in the home exercise program. They absolutely were less in the group activity. Some of that also, the benefits of this, when they calculated the cost, they also included the caregiver's cost. Caregivers get depressed. So they had in this group, they had a little bit of caregiver respite. So the caregiver had a little bit of a break. Um, but, so this was very powerful in terms of the cost of care. All right. Oh, this was a new one. I just went to a conference, uh, the, the Canadian Geriatric Society Conference, and met Dr. Berryman and others, and listened to some of this story. Um, and basically, this is a, a message that, uh, well, there's many roads to the top of the mountain, multiple roads leading to Rome. This was looking at high intensity aerobic training and strength tr training versus other activities really all help you. <laughs> so, um, and they measure by this by uh, gait analysis on a computerized sidewalk where a computer is analyzing steps. And that is a good indicator. So we can tell if someone has mild common impairment by the way they walk on a computerized sidewalk. And what we have them do in our study is uh, or, or our studies at Parkwood, it's not me, I help, but one of my colleagues, Dr. M M Manuel Montero Dasso, will have people with mild cognitive impairment um, walk on the computerized sidewalk while they're naming as many animals as they can 
as fast as they can, or as they're counting backwards by seven, and counting backwards by seven while they're carrying a tray with a glass full of water, right? <laughs> so the brain power accelerates as you do these multitask. At any rate, when these people around age 70 had eight weeks, three times a week of strength and aerobic or upper body or lower body, all the groups improved. There you go. So again, bottom line is something's better than nothing. Oh, and what was this one? Light, oh yes, this is another good one. Because you don't have to be a hero. You don't have to win the marathon and take up power lifting or whatever. This shows you that light and moderate exercise is actually better than vigorous. Something's better than nothing. And I don't know what was, now this is good, it's protection. So anything less than one, meaning you're better off than doing nothing. But light and moderate is actually more protective of, against dementia than heavier, more vigorous exercise. So these were people with mild cognitive impairment. And it's self-report. Mayo, pretty reputable, reputable institution. Okay, and this is a, when we hear that something has a dose response, then we attribute causality. Aerobic fitness improves with all types of exercise for this study. And when you do have more aerobic, so something that's going to make you a little more winded and short of breath, that was shown to actually improve another portion of your brain function in visual spatial. So depth perception, connecting dots, that sort of thing. Attention improves, exercise, even so low doses of aerobic exercise. So these were people who had no cognitive impairment, but they were under active or sedentary. And they were given six months of various doses of no change in their lifestyle, 75 minutes. So the current recommendation is this, 150 minutes a week. Of, that's what most family doctors will tell you. And then they had the 225 minutes a week. Doesn't matter. Half the dose works. Of course, that doesn't mean you just do the minimum required. So the message is, no matter how slow you go, you're still lapping everybody else on the couch. <laughs> And uh, so, is it, so my, this is one of the final slides, and it's a study just to say that it's really never too late. So uh, this trial took people who were very, very frail a, with physical and health problems um, that might cause muscle weakness and osteoarthritis and so forth. They met a frailty scale. They're aged 61 to 89. And they were randomized to basic appropriate for their condition, exercise training, and they compared them to a waitlist control. So everybody eventually got the treatment, but while the, they had one group waiting for the treatment while the other one exercised. And the intervention group uh, improved in endurance, they improved in brain power of executive function, they improved in brain speed of processing, they improved their working memory, their quality of life improved. And they also were more able to participate in the things they liked to do. So they all participated more in their leisure activities and the things they loved after they exercised. And they basically included frail and non-frail patients in the study. All benefited. So then there's many other studies that have been done with small numbers of people. Um, so, the, oh, I misspelled Jennifer's name. It's not Fogarty, it's Fogarty. I just noticed that. Oh, my goodness. That's a shame. So there's been other positive studies. Hers was they all benefited. Um, ballroom dancing. I know uh, my colleague, Dr. Michael Borey and his wife go ballroom dancing once or twice a week. Um, there's a, a trial that's planned. It was published in 2014, but they're just going to start it. I'm looking for that because as they're all, there I am. My bicycle. And then I hate, I really don't like swimming, but I do these little mini triathlons, mini ones, little ones. So I have my little wetsuit on because it's in Lake Erie, <laughs> and it was cold. Yeah. 
So, um, so then there's a swimming study. So swimming, they had a, people with quite progressed dementia, they had them in a swimming program and it improved their sense of well-being. So again, do something, not nothing. So it's never too late to start walking. And oh, I thought I was finishing up. Oh, another graph. You, anyone a visual learner? Here, I like the graph. So <clears throat> the top line that's dotted, you'll see these are people with Alzheimer's disease who started walking, and, or they didn't start walking. These were walkers two hours a week. They had the middle line is the people who only walked about an hour a week, and then this people who had Alzheimer's disease who were sedentary. After one year, the sedentary people with Alzheimer's disease declined. That's, those are memory test scores. Big drop. So it's, and the other ones that maintained. Uh, this, <coughs> this is a fancy, fancy, smancy graph. All it shows is this is how we represent these studies that are studies of studies. So when you get 15 or 20 studies, this, these are all four studies of studies. And you lump them all together. And because you can get these one-off studies. Oh, this one was positive, this one's negative. Which one do I really believe? When you take all the studies of studies and analyze them all, then you think you're getting to the right answer. Every single exercise intervention favors exercise as something good to do. There isn't any one of these studies of studies that say that exercise is bad for your brain. So when a scientist or somebody who's an expert in statistics looks at this graph, they become a believer. So I, in my talk to my physician group, that has great meaning for them. It may just look like a bunch of squares and diamonds to you. I'm not sure. So here's your choices. What are you going to do tonight? Stop <laughs> raining. <laughs> it's hard to do anything else but that after what I've just said. Whoops, I need to go back. So the summarize, once I go see what I missed by aggressively punching this button, there's really strong and growing evidence that a Mediterranean diet prevents strokes, heart attacks, and Alzheimer's disease. Exercise is a strong modulator of our brain function. It's really quite an, a potent medication. And it protects us from a lot of physical disability as well. Meditation is also like taking a pill. Some people can, not, can avoid taking a blood pressure pill if they meditate and they control their stress hormones. And it's, there's growing evidence that meditation can slow Alzheimer's disease, in fact. And it has a multimodal effect on our health. Learning and doing new things is associated with brain health. So those are the four points that I want you to take home. And then this summarizes in a different way. So you're going to evade progression to dementia by eating, thinking, and doing, the Mediterranean diet, learn and do new things, meditate or have some mindfulness practice. That Oh, yeah, this, this specifies that my recommendation is time per day. So 15 minutes a day for meditation, doing exercise, two or more hours a week of walking, two 20 or 30 minute sessions of some sort of resistance training, remember to be safe and gentle with your joints, I don't want anyone to get hurt. And so instead of a 23 and a half hour day, you all have a 22 hour day. You're going to do also a half an hour of music practice, quarter of hour meditation, you're going to play some games, computer games, crossword puzzles, Mahjong, Pac-Man, all those things have had little studies that improve your brain function. Plus your 45-minute walk and weights all average out. You have plenty of time to do that, right? I think that's it. Oh, no, here it is. All right. <laughs>